Hello, everybody. Father Tom Provenzano here with you from the Sister Maruja Causa Studios here at St. John Bosco Parish for our third installment of the parish mission, these days of prayer, reflections on the Easter Triduum. Thank you for coming back. Uh, again, if you've, uh, this is your first time seeing this, if you're jumping in here in the third part, do not lose heart. Uh, the other two episodes are up online at our uh, parish YouTube page. Uh, please, while you're there, like, ring the bell, share these videos with others, spread the good news of Jesus Christ and of the work we're doing here at St. John Bosco. And yes, we're here on the third day. We've been talking about Holy Week and in particular the Easter Triduum. Yesterday we talked about Good Friday and the liturgical ceremonies as well as the, uh, the, the different devotional activities that go on that day. And now we've come to the third day. We've come to this third day of the Triduum, Holy Saturday, where we'll be talking mainly about what's called the Easter Vigil, which really is the center of our liturgical year and really our year as Catholics. And uh, before we begin, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who on Easter Sunday, through your only begotten Son, have conquered death and unlocked for us the path to eternity, grant we pray that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may through the renewal brought by your Spirit rise up in the light of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Mary, help of Christians, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so yes, we have come to Holy Saturday. And, you know, the morning of Holy Saturday, there's really not that much going on. Now, strictly speaking, by the, the laws of the church, fasting and abstinence happen on Good Friday. There is a tradition of a thing called the Paschal Fast, where you could extend that fast into Holy Saturday. Now, you know, when my parents were children, uh, this was before the times of the reforms, these ceremonies that often happen at night, like the Mass of, our, the, Mass of the Lord's Supper on, on Holy Thursday and the Easter Vigil, actually happened in the morning, actually happened during the day. You know, one, one thing I forgot to mention was that there is also this tradition on Holy Thursday night, for instance, of visiting various churches. Uh, I believe it's seven churches was the tradition. And I remember one year when I was already an adult doing this with my own parents. And, they were, and we were finding it hard to do. Not because we had a car, we can go to any parish we wanted to. But we were showing up at parishes that were already closed sometimes. And my parents are saying to themselves, but we used to do this all the time when we were kids. How, do, how is it? And they realized... They were doing it in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> okay. They were going to visit these altars of repose, which oftentimes were very beautifully decorated with, with lilies and flowers. But it was the middle of the afternoon because the Mass of the Lord's Supper had happened in the morning. In 1955, Pope Pius XII restored the Holy Week ceremonies to the evening and really gave them more or less the shape that we have them today. And it's the same way with the Easter Vigil. My mother used to tell told the story that around noontime on Holy Saturday, the bells of the church would ring. And that meant your fasting was over. You could go eat now. Why? Because the Easter Vigil already happened. It didn't happen at night. <laughs> I guess in our case, it happened like in our parish's case, it happened like at 10 in the morning. I've heard stories where the Easter Vigil happened at uh, 8 or 7 in the morning sometimes, okay? And naturally, the people weren't there. There weren't baptisms. It wasn't connected with 
the reception of the sacraments for adults as it is today. What happened in 1955, and this is before Vatican II, okay? This has nothing to do with the reforms of Vatican II. Pope Pius XII restored these beautiful ceremonies really to their proper place and helped to bring out really their true and deeper meaning. These weren't just things that we do to get, get through in order to get the Easter Sunday, uh, formalities, if you will. But they really are steps along this road following our Lord through this great Paschal mystery. Again, Paschal mystery. The mystery of our Lord's of dying, suffering, dying, and rising. Now, generally speaking, again, uh, the, the, the rubrics will we'll talk about extending the, the fast as, as close to the uh, vigil as you can. Now, as we're going to talk about, the vigil doesn't begin until sundown. In fact, it can't begin until sundown. Uh, I think you have to be kind of sensible about this. I think that noon ringing of the bell is probably not a bad rule of thumb to go by. <laughs> I would say sometime, you know, uh, certainly in the morning or, or mid-afternoon, you could probably uh, end your fast safely and knowing that you've, you know, you've dedicated yourself to the Lord. So on Holy Saturday, the church waits at the Lord's tomb. tomb. This is from the, the Roman Missal waits at the Lord's tomb in prayer and fasting, meditating on the passion and death of his, and on his descent into hell, and waiting his resurrection. Now, you're going to, now, we'll get to this descent into hell, because uh, people get really freaked out by that, and they, they're not sure what exactly it means. But we're going we're gonna to get there. But before we get there, again, just as on Holy Thursday, and Good Friday, there are no masses said, okay? But what can you do? You can go and celebrate what we call Tenebrae. Uh, and Tenebrae is not only on Holy Saturday, but it's also on Holy Thursday and Good Friday as well. So there is a thing called the Liturgy of the Hours, okay? It's all priests and most religious are bound to pray at least part of the Liturgy of the Hours. It's essentially a series of prayers that happen throughout the day where we pray the Psalms. And the idea is that it's sanctifying the day by our prayers. And we are praying with the church and we are praying for the church. These aren't private devotions. You know, I may have a very strong devotion to the to the divine mercy, for instance. And I may like praying the divine mercy chaplet. In fact, I do like praying the divine mercy chaplet. But the fact of the matter is, it's a personal devotion. No Catholic has to pray the divine mercy chaplet. And that goes along with any other uh, novenas or any other of, of these devotions. They're good. They're laudatory. But you find the devotions that fit for you. I've got a very strong devotion to St. Michael the Archangel. Okay, I have a devotion to St. Joseph. There's a few saints I have a devotion to. I've always had a great love for St. Teresa of Avila, for instance. Okay, That's me. Maybe for somebody else, there's other saints that they have devotion to. Okay. The one thing that we should all have in common is our devotion to the Blessed Mother. And I would say the rosary is something more than just a private devotion. It's not a liturgy. It's not an official prayer of the church. But I think it's something more than just something private. But in general, we can pick and choose those devotions because the Lord wants to give us variety. And he wants to allow us to be able to approach him in the ways that we're comfortable with and that we're suited for, okay? The Liturgy of the Hours is something different, okay? Liturgy by its nature is an official public worship of the church. And so for me, praying the office 
isn't just something I like to do. And I'll admit, I, I do enjoy doing it. Uh, sometimes we can find it a drudgery a bit. Uh, but I actually do enjoy praying the Psalms every day. Okay, But I just don't do it because I like it. I do it really because I need to. I have to. I'm praying for you. <laughs> I'm not just praying for myself. This is not about my own personal fulfillment spiritually. This is about my priestly duty to sacrifice even times of the day for the needs of the faithful. Okay, And we in our Salesian community pray together twice. We pray morning prayer together and we pray evening prayer together. What's called louds or lauds, which is morning prayer and vespers, which is evening prayer. But there's other times in the day, midday prayer, what they call the officer readings, night prayer, that I do on my own when I can fit them in. Okay. When we can't celebrate the Mass on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and uh, Holy Saturday, we have this opportunity to celebrate what's called tenebrae, which is basically taking what's called vigils, or the office of readings, and putting it together with lauds, or morning prayer, and praying them together. And it involves six psalms altogether, three psalms for the office of readings, and three psalms for morning prayer, two long readings for the office of reading, so a long reading uh, from Scripture, a longer reading from Scripture, and a longer reading from maybe one of the fathers of the church, from the writings of one of the saints, sometimes from an ecumenical council, or from some other church document. But it's meant to enrich us in a deeper way in the Word of God and in the tradition of the church. So oftentimes what we do in the parish, we'll call it tenebrae, but it really isn't in the strict sense. Uh, but who cares? <laughs> what matters is that you're praying and that you're praying the office, you're praying with the church, you're praying for the church. And what sort of distinguishes tenebrae is that you'll have this candelabra. And for each psalm, uh, you ex you, uh, I believe it's you extinguish a candle, okay, uh, until the end. And it's a, it's a celebration of, of lights, if you will. And the priest will be vested like he's vested for mass with a stole, and he will lead the people. Uh, we've done this in most of the parishes that we are in. I believe here at our parish it's done at 8 in the morning on all those days. And it's bilingual. It's in both Spanish and English. And uh, it's a way of opening ourselves up to a different way of praying, a way of praying that's so important because it's with the church and for the church. Now, we talked about the descent into hell. And that sometimes can disturb us a little bit. What does it mean that Jesus descended into hell? Well, the first thing you have to understand is that we're not talking about a place of punishment, and certainly not a place of eternal punishment. Uh, from Catholic Answers here, I've, I've sort of uh, grabbed something from them. Uh, it says that on Holy Saturday, but we say that after Jesus died, he sojourned to the realm of the dead. Right, that's from the Catechism 632. He preached the good news to the spirits in prison there. That's from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. So the idea is, is that Jesus descended to the realm of the dead where he encountered all the souls that had ever lived, going back to Adam and Eve. And he is literally preaching to them the gospel. And he is giving them the chance to accept his gospel. And hell, in this case, is equivalent to a place called Sheol in Hebrew or Hades in Greek, the abode of the dead. But again, it doesn't necessarily uh, connote punishment necessarily. It's more of a place of waiting. So the idea here is that all the holy patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, David, 
the king, all those who came in the Old Testament are there waiting. They were awaiting the Savior. And Jesus goes down there to lead them out of Hades, out of Sheol, to come with him to paradise. And this is an old icon, an ancient icon. And you can see that uh, Jesus has burst the doors of hell, okay? And he's stomping on top of a demon there, okay? He's got uh, the cross that kind of looks like a processional cross in his hand. And those first two people who are greeting him are Adam and Eve, okay? And then behind them, all the patriarchs, prophets, and kings of the Old Testament. And as a part of that Office of Readings, that Tenebrae service we celebrate, there is this reading, the patristic reading, or the, the non-scriptural reading, comes from an ancient homily on Holy Saturday. And we're just, going to, we're just going to read part of it for you. What is happening, this letter begins, or this sermon begins. Today there is a great silence over the earth, a great silence and stillness, a great silence because the king sleeps. The earth was in terror and was still because God slept in the flesh and raised up those who were sleeping for, from the ages. God has died in the flesh and the underworld has trembled. Truly, he goes to seek out our first parents like lost sheep. He wished to visit those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. He goes to free the prisoner Adam and his fellow prisoner Eve from their pains. He who is God and Adam's son. I command you, Jesus says, awake sleeper, I have not made you to be held in prison in the underworld. Arise from the dead. I am the life of the dead. Arise, O man, work of my hands, arise. You who were fashioned in my image, rise. Let us go hence, for you in me and I in you, together we are one undivided person. So this, this beautiful reflection, this beautiful idea that Christ had to preach the gospel not only to the people of his own time, but to also the people of all ages offering them this opportunity at salvation. And who does Christ preach to today? Well, my sisters and brothers, not to jump ahead 50 days, but the Lord gave the Holy Spirit to the church so that we would be his body here and now. We are the ones who have the responsibility now of going out and preaching that good news. Our Lord preached it during his earthly ministry, he preached it to the multitude of the dead after he died in, the, in, those, in, the, in those hours when his body lay in the tomb awaiting resurrection. And now he sends us forth to go and to preach the good news of salvation to all the world. Now, really, that's it for most of Saturday. Uh, sometimes there are a blessing of Easter baskets there's things like that that go on. But really, you know, I could tell you as a priest, whew, these are the three busiest days of the year. Three busiest days of the year. But I will say that sometimes Holy Saturday morning anyway and early afternoon is sort of a time of more quiet where maybe you can take a little more time to pray. Yeah, you got to do the last minute uh, preparations for the Easter Vigil. Usually got groups of volunteers in church getting things ready, uh, setting up everything, uh, making sure the church looks nice and pretty with all the flowers and, uh, and everything. Uh, but generally, it is a good time to kind of reflect a little bit and to just give thanks to the Lord uh, for the beautiful gift that he's given us of this Easter Triduum and of the gift of his son. So the Easter Vigil itself. It's prescribed to begin after sundown, okay? Sometime around early February, or it might even be later in December, every pastor gets a letter from the archdiocese telling them when they can begin the Easter Vigil. Sundown on 
April the 8th, will begin at this time. I'm not sure what sundown is this, this April 8th. And you may not begin <laughs> the Easter Vigil, therefore, before this time. Usually it's around 7.30 or 8 o'clock. It's usually, you know, uh, you know, we don't have to be so scrupulous about it. If the last rays of the sun <laughs> are still shining over the horizon, we don't have to be uh, too crazy. But at the same time, it's kind of pointless lighting the fire for the Easter fire, you know, the middle of the day. You, you kind of lose a little bit of the symbolism, huh? And that's very important. The symbolism is important. So, again, as the, uh, as the Roman Missal says, uh, by most ancient tradition, this is the night of keeping vigil for the Lord, uh, in which following the gospel admonition, the faithful carry lighted lamps in their hands, should be like those looking for the Lord when he returns, so that at his coming he may find us awake and have them sit at table. You know, my sisters and brothers, I, uh, the other talk I, I mentioned that in Scripture we have many levels of meaning. Uh, and I would say, you know, in the liturgy and in our worship, we have many levels of meaning as well, okay? And so certainly... We're celebrating a past event, but we're also rejoicing now with the choirs of heaven now. Okay, there's an Eastern tradition that basically talks about that, you know, Easter is now. <laughs> what we're celebrating is now. We're not celebrating something from the past. But it's past. We're uniting presently with the choirs of angels in heaven. That's what makes each Mass, in a way, a unique event. Because we're not just re remembering something from the past or even reliving something from the past, but we're participating in something re very real right now. But we're also looking to the future with our lamps lit, waiting for the Lord's return. We should never lose sight of that. It's all those things together. Okay. So, as I said, it takes place at night. Now, what is a vigil? Some people might ask, what is a vigil? So a vigil takes place at night. It's an ancient custom of waiting prayerfully with the Lord and for the Lord, meditating upon his word. Uh, in the ancient church, let's say in the first four or five centuries, uh, the Easter Vigil sometimes wouldn't start till after midnight, actually, and it would go till dawn. The idea is that you're waiting, you know, Christ is the rising sun that never sets. And so that's what we're, we're waiting for, and we're keeping watch with the Lord. And this reading of the Word of God is central to it, very, very important. The Easter Vigil uh, has as many as nine readings from Scripture. Okay, The Missal really strongly recommends that we use all nine. Most places don't, to be honest with you. And yes, you have that option of maybe swapping some readings out. Uh, but you have to have at least three of the Old Testament readings. And one of the readings has to be the Exodus story of the, the Hebrews passing through the Red Sea. That has to be there. Uh, the early church saw a connection between the exodus of Moses and what Jesus did on the cross. Okay. If you remember the film, The Passion of the Christ, there's a scene toward the beginning where Mary, the mother of God, and Mary Magdalene are together. It's just before Jesus is arrested, but they know something is wrong. They know something is up. And remember, it's supposed to be a Passover night. And Mary Magdalene says to Mary, now this is not scriptural, it's poetic, but it's a beautiful, but it's a beautiful poem. Mary Magdalene asks Mary, the mother of God, why is this night different from all other nights? And Mary responds, because on this night, 
our Lord with a strong arm liberated his people from slavery. What are they talking about? That's the Passover meal. Those are, that's part of the prayer that's said at the Passover meal. The youngest member of the family goes to the oldest and asks, why is this night different from all other nights? And then the eldest in the house tells the Passover story and even explains the different foods on the Passover table and why they're being eaten. Yes, this night is different from all other nights. We sit with the Lord in vigil. We sing his praises and we await his return again. So before we, uh, so this has many parts. We could be here all night, but we're not going to, okay? <laughs> I'll go through this as expediently as I can, but without cheating you either. So the ceremony begins outside the church. Uh, here is uh, from Chicago a few years ago. Uh, there is a fire built outside the church. The priest blesses the fire. Then he blesses the Easter candle and he puts in the, the, uh, the pins that have little beads of incense on them. Okay. Uh, it is to symbolize that now indeed Christ has risen. He is, he is the light of the world. He has conquered sin and death. The procession then begins into church. Usually it's a deacon, it can be a priest, carrying the Easter candle. In the darkness of the church, the lights in the church are all off. And people, little by little, begin to light their candles from the Easter candle and then share their light with others. And just as we did on Good Friday with the cross, the deacon begins at the back of the church, lifts up the Easter, the lit Easter candle, Christ light of the world, proclaims Christ light of the world. Cristo luz del mundo. Gracias a Dios. Okay. Then goes to the middle of the church. Again, lifts up the, the candle. Christ light of the world. Thanks be to God. And then finally gets to the foot of the altar and repeats it a third time. And then puts the candle into its holder. Again, the lights in the church are off. The only thing that is giving light are the candles now that everyone is sharing. All right, and it's such a beautiful thing. And then the deacon goes and proclaims what's called the exaltet, or the Easter proclamation. Uh, the deacon places the paschal candle in the stand, goes to the pulpit, and, ch and chants the exaltet. This is an ancient hymn calling the church to rejoice at the rising of the Lord. The, he is singing the praises of the Paschal candle and singing of Christ, the risen light of the world. And it really is so beautiful. Exalt, let them exalt, hosts of heaven. Exalt, let angel ministers of God exalt. Let the trumpet of salvation sound aloud, our mighty king of our mighty king's triumph. This is the night which once you were led, once you led our forebearers, Israel's children from slavery in Egypt and made them pass dry shod through the Red Sea. This is the night that with a pillar of fire banished the darkness of sin. O oh, truly necessary sin of Adam, destroyed completely by the death of Christ, O oh, happy fault, that earned so great and glorious a Redeemer. Those are just a few of the lines from this, this beautiful hymn of praise to God. The vigil continues. The, liter the Roman Missal calls it the mother of all vigils, okay? And again, encourages that nine readings, all nine readings. But again, in, in many instances, uh, nine readings are not necessarily proclaimed. Nonetheless, be attentive to the readings. It begins with the story of creation. 
and how God created the world good. God did not create us for sin, did not create us to uh, be slaves, but created us to be free people and to enjoy his freedom in the garden. He invited us to live the fullness of life in perfect harmony with nature and with one another. But we read about how sin, through the devil, did come into the world and how we were separated from that paradise. But Jesus, or excuse me, but God did not abandon us to this. Through the patriarch Abraham, he promised us that he would make of his family first a great nation, but then lead all nations to him through that revelation first given to, to him, to Abraham. And we hear the story of the sacrifice of Isaac and how the Lord told, uh, told Abraham, no, do not harm your son. In a, in a way, because Abraham was willing to give his own son, our Lord then gives his son for us. And, he can, and how he gave freedom to the, the Hebrews escaping Egypt through the Red Sea, leading them from slavery into freedom. So Jesus, through his death and resurrection, leads us in an exodus from, freedom, from sin and slavery to sin through to life eternal. This message is amplified by the prophets. At this point, after the last prophet is read, the lights of the church come on, the Gloria is sung, and the reading from St. Paul is proclaimed. It's not the first time that we, we, we pray uh, the Gloria during Lent, but it's certainly a high point of the ceremony. And usually bells are ringing and the lights of the altar are lit and it's, it's uh, really a beautiful emotional uh, event. And then we hear the proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus meeting Mary Magdalene outside the empty tomb. At this point, after the liturgy of the word, we have the baptismal liturgy. So what's going to happen is candidate, the candidates for baptism are brought forward. Uh, first, they make their profession of faith. Then they're baptized. You know, the, we usually baptize them in a pool. All right, use lots of water. So that means they go out then, because they usually come in their regular clothes. Then they leave after baptism, put on the white garment. They put on a white uh, dress or a white suit. Then they're confirmed, and they're confirmed by the priest. They're confirmed by the pastor. By the liturgical law of the church, the pastor has the, not only the right, but the responsibility to give confirmation right away. Okay. Then we make our profession of faith, we renew our profession of faith, and we are sprinkled with water, okay, with the holy water. And then uh, Mass goes on as normal, and we receive the body of Christ. And the Easter vigil then comes to an end. My sisters and brothers, uh, at this point, it's like we've been through the ringer. Whew, think of where we started. We started with, with Jesus at the Last Supper and being arrested and taken away and suffering on Good Friday, the scourging, and the crucifixion, and then the waiting of the lying of him lying in the tomb, and now finally, that glory of resurrection. I hope that all of you are able to participate in the Easter Vigil and in all these ceremonies 
of the, the triduum. And that you know that Easter is not just this three days, not just this one day, but is actually 50 days of celebration. If we fast for 40 days, we celebrate for 50, okay? The resurrection of the Lord. And so I thank you all for being with us. I would like to thank Carlos, Carolina, Angie, Darwin, who is somewhere in the Dominican Republic, who put this all together, okay? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here babbling, but they're the ones that did the hard work, okay, of putting all this together, and I'm grateful to them for it. Know of, uh, that I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. And I, at this time, I will give you my blessing, asking Almighty God to bless all of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. God bless you.